Hello everyone, thank you for joining our Spotlight on Skin Cancer webinar series. My name is Sabrina Hanna and I'm the Executive Director at the Save Your Skin Foundation. In today's webinar, Understanding Your Pathology Report, we are joined by Dr. Alan Spatz who will provide insight related to your report so that you can play a more active role in your cancer care. To diagnose disease such as cancer, sample tissue called a biopsy is taken from a patient and examined by a pathologist to determine if cancer is present. The pathologist will then examine specimens removed during surgery to determine whether the tumor is benign or cancerous, and if cancerous, the exact cell type, grade, and stage of the tumor. The, patho the pathologist, who is a member of your medical team, writes the report that your treating doctor uses to provide the best care for you as a patient. Dr. Alan Spatz is the director of for the pathology department at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal and professor of pathology and oncology at McGill University and holds a Canada Research Chair in Molecular Pathology. Dr. Spatz presently directs the X Chromosome and Cancer Research Lab at the Lady Davis Institute and leads an international research group on cutaneous melanoma. He is also the director of the McGill JGH Dubrovsky Molecular Pathology Center that, which opened in 2013. This new cutting-edge facility is leading the way to personalized medicine by using molecular analysis to identify tumor biomarkers to advance the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Dr. Spast has authored more than 180 original scientific papers, reports, review articles, and books. And just before we get started, I, I just want to remind our participants that there will be a 30-minute Q&A at the end of the presentation. And uh, to the right-hand side of your screen, you'll find a question box that you can type in your questions and send to. Uh, and with that, thank you, Dr. Spatz, for joining us today. So good morning. I'm uh, Alan Spatz, and I'm uh, grateful to the Save Your Skin uh, Foundation for organizing this uh, interactive session on uh, pathology reporting and uh, indeed this is extremely important for uh, our, our patients to uh, have uh, uh, at least an understanding of the pathology report because it has been uh, well demonstrated that 60% uh, uh, of the hospital based uh, decisions will be directly driven by uh, pathology information and therefore uh, uh, information contained in the pathology report. So I, I look forward for the uh, Q&A uh, session at the end of this presentation. And uh, uh, of course, this is totally focused on, uh, on skin. And we have to say that uh, uh, the skin is a very complex organ. And uh, because of this complexity, it's important to have uh, uh, some uh, uh, view on uh, what's the histological, meaning the uh, tissue organization of, of skin because each uh, component can give rise to, uh, to tumors. Uh, so here actually you have, uh, you have a skin with uh, the different components. The uh, most superficial one is called the epidermis. This is what actually you see when uh, uh, you, uh, you look your, your skin. Then you have uh, uh, what we call uh, annexa, annexa and uh, the most important one, the most uh, common one, is the uh, follicular uh, uh, annexa that will give rise to, uh, to hairs. So here, for instance, you have, uh, you have a hair. Uh, um, you can have the, uh, uh, the dermis, uh, uh, that is what we call uh, conjunctive tissue because it's not epithelial. Uh, you have other components like uh, sebaceous, uh, sebaceous glands that will give the sebum that is very important to protect the skin. You have some mashal uh, uh, that, for instance, will uh, help uh, uh, rising hairs, uh, uh, and you have, uh, you have fat. So each of these components, as I said, can give rise to, uh, to tumors, but uh, uh, the two main uh, most frequent tumors actually uh, originate from the epidermis, and these are the epidermal carcinomas. We call them carcinoma because they are epithelial. Uh, the most frequent one is the BCC, the basal cell carcinoma. Uh, the second most frequent is the squamous cell carcinoma, and both the basal cell carcinoma, or BCC, and the squamous cell carcinoma originate from the epidermis or from the, uh, the epithelium that actually will surround 
the uh, hair follicle. Another important uh, uh, component that is not visible at this magnification uh, uh, are the melanocytes. The melanocytes are very sophisticated cells that you have mainly here along the junction between the epidermis and the dermis and these melanocytes were synthesized melanin. Melanin is this uh, pigmented uh, uh, product that will give the, uh, uh, the brown uh, uh, color to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the skin, that will protect the skin uh, uh, toward the toxic uh, uh, UVA and the UVBs that are the ultraviolet uh, 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 rays uh, arising from, from sun exposure, for instance. And these melanocytes are like melanin factories, but at the same time, they can give rise to tumors as well that could be benign, and we call that uh, uh, a nevus. A nevus is, uh, is a mole, and uh, it's a benign uh, a melanocytic tumor rising from these melanocytes, but sometimes uh, they can be malignant and give rise to a cancer that is called a melanoma. There are other types of tumors, each of them arising from these different components. They are much rarer. Uh, we are not going to discuss that. You can have sarcomas, you can have other types of carcinomas, but uh, they will not be discussed at least in the presentation. So let's start with uh, these uh, two uh, tumors I mentioned, the uh, epidermal carcinomas. Uh, 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 remember the BCCs and the SCCs arising mainly from the epidermis and the melanomas. On the left side here, you have a high magnification of this epidermis. Uh, this is the surface of the skin. This here you have the deep part of the skin. And uh, you see that, uh, because it's a, it's a histological section, you see that on profile. So here you have the keratin, here you have the epidermis. Uh, uh, and here, at the junction between the epidermis and the dermis, you have these, uh, these cells dendritic cells, because we call them dendritic because they have dendrites uh, that you can produce these uh, prolongements that you see here. And these cells are melanocytes. They are these famous melanocytes that can give rise to uh, either uh, uh, moles, uh, uh, benign moles like nevi, or uh, malignant moles uh, uh, or melanomas. This is uh, an example of uh, 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 epidermal uh, uh, carcinoma. And it's important to mention that these epithelial carcinomas, BCCs and, uh, and squamous cell carcinomas, usually arise in sun damaged skin. And there is a direct correlation between uh, the uh, uh, cumulative exposure to sun and the risk to get a, a BCC or squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes you have uh, pre-epitheliomatous, meaning pre-cancerous lesions, and uh, here you have a male patient with uh, uh, an actinic uh, uh, keratosis that actually you, you see here. And this is the histological cat with the epidermis that is abnormal because uh, there, are, there is too much cur uh, keratin. The cells here are not uh, are completely normal. You see that they do not resemble here the more normal skin. And actually you already have here uh, a squamous cell uh, uh, carcinoma rising in the dermis. So this is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma uh, uh, arising in a sun damaged skin with a, a, a precancerous lesion that is called an actinic keratosis or AK. Uh, another example where here you have a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. We call it in situ and it's just confined to the epidermis. And uh, another name for these, uh, for these lesions are, are, are Bowen's disease and you may have seen that in a pathology report. This is, on the contrary, an invasive squamous cell carcinoma that is associated with a low uh, risk uh, of further uh, tumor evolution, uh, but actually this risk uh, stays usually low. Uh, this is an example of an invasive squamous cell carcinoma, and we call it uh, well differentiated because actually they resemble the normal epidermis. So the squamous cell carcinomas or, or SCCs can occur in skin or mucosal sites uh, from anywhere actually on the body, uh, usually from sun-exposed skin, not always, they can arise also in scars, 
uh, or another type of chronic lesions like uh, stasis uh, ulcers that we can have on, uh, on legs, usually associated with vascular problems. The incidence, meaning the, uh, uh, the, the rate of uh, new cases increased uh, in uh, increases in immunocompromised uh, patients, uh, especially patients with uh, uh, transplant like a renal transplant or other types of immunocompromised uh, patients. The prognosis is directly related to the differentiation uh, uh, like for instance uh, uh, here we had a good well differentiated tumor which is good. The risk increases when the differentiated uh, decreases like uh, poor differentiation and, and the prognosis is also associated with size. The, uh, another type of, uh, of tumor that is very important because it's very frequent, although uh, it's almost always associated with a very uh, uh, benign and very indolent, uh, uh, not benign, but very indolent uh, course, meaning that there is a very low risk of a further evolution is the basal cell carcinoma or BCC that is actually is really the most frequent uh, malignant tumor on the skin. Uh, uh, many patients and many a uh, uh, large part of the population uh, uh, will have a BCC during uh, uh, the uh, uh, lifetime. This is, for instance, a patient with a, 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 a typical uh, pearl uh, uh, looking uh, uh, nodular basal cell carcinoma. This is another patient when you see a BCC that sometimes is uh, ill-defined uh, clinically. Uh, this is uh, a large type of, uh, of BCCs and sometimes the BCCs can indeed be very indolent in terms of clinical evolution but can enlarge progressively and uh, will need a surgery that sometimes is complicated. In rare instances, the BCCs, these BCCs are locally aggressive, especially in some locations, for instance, uh, 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 for instance here, or in the medial, uh, the medial axis, and uh, then they can, uh, they can need uh, uh, complicated and sophisticated surgeries uh, to be removed. So the basal cell carcinomas can have different subtypes, histological subtypes that will be uh, precise in the pathology reports, and uh, these different subtypes may have different uh, clinical implications and different uh, implications for, um, for therapy. So the most um, frequent and classical type of uh, basal cell carcinoma is a nodular BCC that you can see here. These are made of tumors uh, of uh, uh, tumor lobules that are usually quite quite well demarcated. You recognize that this is a skin. The epidermis is here. The dermis is here. And in here you have this uh, this tumor that looks a bit uh, uh, purple or, or what we call basophilic. And this is a nodular BCC. Another type of BCC that is very frequent is the superficial type uh, uh, basal cell carcinoma. And uh, here the lesion is a bit different from the nodular BCC. You have these tumor lobules that actually are attached to the epidermis. Again, the epidermis, the dermis. Here you have the lobules. And here the problem is that these tumors are, are multifocal meaning that they can arise from at the same time in different, in different parts of the skin. And therefore, when you remove this lesion, the surgeon may think that, and the pathologist may think that this is complete, but actually you have another lobule that uh, is in the other side of, uh, of the surgical margin, and then you can have a recurrence. So this explains that some uh, uh, histological types, the superficial type or the infiltrative type, like here, uh, that is poorly defined, uh, um, may need what we call a mouse surgery. So what is a mouse surgery? Here you have a patient that actually is under general anesthesia, even uh, uh, if this patient has uh, open eyes. And actually here there is a lesion that has been removed by the surgeon. And you need to be sure that the lesion that has been removed has been completely excised. So uh, uh, here we do this mouse surgery when actually we, we do special uh, tangential cats that are analyzed under the microscope during the procedure. And to do that, you have this uh, uh, part of the skin that is uh, uh, frozen to make it, uh, to, to harden it. And then when it's hard, you can cut it in very thin slices of uh, four to five uh, micrometers in thickness. 
And you have, for instance, here this uh, an example of the histological slide we look under the microscope. And here you have, for instance, this uh, basal, basal cell carcinoma uh, 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 quartz that you can see on this slide. And we assess the margins to be sure that the surgeon has completely removed the lesion. When the lesion has been completely removed, then there is a, a, a graft that is a type of a plastic surgery. And uh, these surgeries, despite the quite impressive uh, um, uh, aspect it looks like during the surgery, ac actually have very good results with uh, usually very low uh, cosmetic uh, uh, impact. Another type of tumor I will uh, uh, spend some time because uh, about because it's very important is the, the cutaneous melanoma, which is a type of uh, malignant uh, tumor or cancer rising from the melanocytes. Uh, as I mentioned, these melanocytes are like uh, sophisticated chemical factories that would produce melanin, and the melanin would protect the skin against the uh, UV, uh, UV exposure, but at the same time, uh, when they are, especially when they are exposed to acute, meaning brutal uh, uh, sun exposure, can uh, uh, give rise to, to a melanoma. So uh, these are important uh, uh, cancer. They were the first uh, cause of mortality by skin cancer. Uh, they still are, and uh, the incidence is uh, rising in uh, very dramatically in Western countries, uh, they uh, double every uh, 10 years, which is a very important increase in, uh, in new cases. Uh, these cancers rise uh, uh, in a context of uh, genetic environment interaction. They are more frequent in a Caucasian um, population, people with uh, white skin, especially when they, they do, the skin is uh, very white in patients, and, I mean, in population with a difficult, uh, uh, difficulty to, to tan, for instance, what we call some phototypes. And here the incidence is uh, 17 for 100,000 uh, 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 adults in uh, um, uh, non-Hispanic white U.S. Uh, people. And there is an interaction with the acute UV exposure, meaning uh, and people, for instance, with very white skin, going to uh, sunny uh, places and getting uh, like uh, uh, sunbath and acute uh, UVs. Um, the five-year survival, and I think this is important to say that these data are coming from the pre-immunotherapy era, and melanoma is, uh, has uh, uh, seen a breakthrough in therapy that we're going to discuss a bit, but. These data were from the pre, uh, came from the pre immunotherapy era, and they, 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 they will change. Uh, um, they will improve dramatically after this uh, immunotherapy. So currently, they are at 95% survival rate for stage one and two, uh, which are the localized melanomas. Uh, uh, this survival rate drops to uh, 60% when there is a regional lymph node uh, uh, metastasis. And, uh, it dropped, well, it used to drop to 15% for the distant metastasis uh, uh, main patients with uh, distant localizations of their melanoma. Uh, this at least illustrates that the sooner is the better, meaning that uh, the sooner you diagnose the melanoma, uh, uh, the thinner it is, and when it's thin, then it's associated with better prognosis. This is what we are going to discuss now with the specific way of reporting histologically, meaning pathologically, these melanomas. So just to mention once again that uh, there's been a breakthrough in treatment, and probably this is the most important breakthrough in cancers since the uh, 70s. This is the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the use of immunotherapy to boost the patient's uh, immune system to treat uh, melanomas. And uh, just a few days ago, uh, there's been a, a, a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the best uh, medical journal, by the uh, EOTC uh, melanoma group. Uh, um, Dr. Alexander Egermont is the uh, main, uh, uh, is the principal investigator of this study, showing that in high risk uh, melanoma patients, you can give this uh, uh, molecule, 
in epilumumab, and this will improve considerably the prognosis, reducing mortality of uh, 30%. So here you have uh, the clinical appearance of the melanoma following the, uh, uh, what the WHO has called the ABCDE criteria, which is asymmetry, ill-defined borders, homogeneous color, large diameter, uh, fast evolving uh, lesion, and all of, them, all of these should lead to suspicion by, uh, for instance, the patient, the family doctor, anyone seeing this type of lesions. Here, by, in, in contrast, you have a totally benign mole, which is a small nevus, uh, um, here you have another aspect of a, of a, of a um, primary melanoma. Sometimes these melanomas are not asymmetrical, but they are very round. But here you have a fast evolving, very dark uh, lesion uh, with some type of ulceration actually uh, clinically. Uh, that is what we call a nodular melanoma. So uh, let's now go to the specifics information you can have in the pathology report. So uh, the first is the diagnosis. The first thing the pathologist does is to confirm that the lesion is, uh, uh, is a melanoma, for instance, or is a basal cell carcinoma, is a squamous cell carcinoma. And this is uh, sometimes uh, very difficult because the lesion is difficult to diagnose even under the microscope. And this difficulty will be mentioned, but we're going to discuss that in a few minutes. Let's now go to the specific information that will be given by the pathologist for melanoma. And the, uh, one of the most important ones is what we call the breast loss index or, 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 or melanoma thickness. As I mentioned, the thickness is the uh, uh, most important prognostic variable in the melanoma. It was identified by a young uh, uh, statistician, Alexander Breslow, in the 70s. And actually, since the 70s, this has uh, uh, been kept as the most important prognostic feature in, uh, in melanomas. So how do we do that? So it's simple. Uh, uh, here you have an example of a melanoma. And what we measure is under the microscope, uh, using a microscopic scale, the uh, uh, distance between the superficial part of the epidermis and the deepest part of the melanoma. Uh, so here it would be, for instance, an example of a lesion of 0.7 millimeters. Sometimes uh, uh, it takes, uh, uh, um, it's more difficult because you have to exclude other areas. Here you see that you have a follicle that is involved by the melanoma, but this is not taken into account. So here it's an example of a melanoma that measures 0.7 millimeters in thickness. And uh, the reason why we use that because uh, uh, it's because you see here the survival curve uh, according to uh, tumor thickness. So here you have the mortality rate by thickness, and it's almost linear. You have this uh, uh, this very strong correlation between the mortality rate and uh, and tumor thickness. Another variable that would be given by the pathologist is whether there is or not a ulceration. And ulceration in melanoma is very important. This is uh, evaluated by the pathologist using the, uh, the microscope. Uh, it's very important. We define that very strictly. And uh, this table that might uh, look a bit complex just illustrates that uh, in an uh, international consortium to look at the prognostic information that is driven by the American Joint Cancer Committee, or AJCC, there is what we call a staging system where we group patients according to prognostic variables in several categories. And for melanoma, we, we group them according to thickness, ulceration, mitotic rate. And other, other variables are important, for instance, the anatomical side, the gender. Uh, um, females uh, um, uh, evolve uh, better than, than males. We don't understand completely why, but actually we have recent data giving an explanation on that. The, the age is important as well. And we group actually these patients according mainly to the histological information, and this is called microstaging. And this microstaging, beside the precise diagnosis, is a very important information actually the pathologist would be given in, in its report. Uh, in his report. So uh, uh, this is an example of uh, uh, the variables we are going to look at. So let's now be a bit more specific. So the first thing that is important to realize 
is that the time where the pathologist was just uh, uh, dictating uh, free uh, uh, text, meaning like long speeches to describe the lesions, are, are, are just over. Now, all the pathologists in the world should use the same uh, uh, type of uh, what we call a synopsis. This is a key word to illustrate that actually the pathologists are giving all the same variables in the pathology report. And this means that you have a bit of flexibility to describe the lesion with your own words, that actually uh, all these variables are very uh, much codified and standardized by international consortiums. So for instance, here you have the histological type, and uh, you have different type of uh, uh, different uh, uh, groups of histological types, like uh, melanoma nodular type, melanoma superficial spreading type, this is the example of the, uh, uh, the synopsis we use at the uh, uh, Jewish Hospital of, of Montreal. Uh, so we click actually on this category and this will generate automatically the pathology report and we're going to see a pathology report in, in, in two minutes, uh, the, uh, the, the information. Ulceration, absent or present, uh, chronic and images, whether they're absent or, or present, what we call regression, which means that if whether the lesion has disappeared uh, uh, on the, uh, in the uh, histologically, et cetera, et cetera. We, of course, remember we give the thickness in uh, millimeters or, or usually with one to two figures after the, after the comma. This is called the breast loss thickness, et cetera. And there is a bit of information that will be given at the end of the report. So the, also another uh, important information will be given based on the examination of the sentinel lymph node. Uh, the sentinel lymph node is a technique that uh, initially was invented uh, uh, from, uh, to, to better refine the prognosis of uh, penile carcinomas, but actually it has been used very rapidly uh, uh, in melanomas and uh, this, uh, uses, uh, this use has been uh, uh, strongly uh, pushed forward by a surgeon uh, uh, who was the, the champion of these central nodes. Uh, his name was uh, uh, Donald Morton. Uh, and Donald Morton proposed to use something lymph nodes examination as uh, the witness of what happens uh, uh, in the rest of the lymph nodes. So you use a technique where you inject a blue dye or radioactive, slow, uh, low radioactive material around the primary lesion, for instance, the, the melanoma in the skin, and you look at the, the, the first lymph node that will receive this radioactive uh, material or the blue dye, and you know that this lymph node will be, that will be called the sentinel lymph node, uh, will be the reflect of the rest of the lymph nodes. So when the lymph, this lymph node is involved by the lesion, it may uh, lead to uh, information that the rest of the lymph nodes may be involved as well, and, and therefore there will be a discussion to remove the rest of the lymph nodes and uh, maybe to give uh, adjuvant treatments. So this is why we put that in the report as well. And then, as I mentioned, we group the patients based on histological variables according to the AGCC microstaging system. So for instance, we call a lesion T1, T is for tumor, P is for um, pathology. So T1, which is the, uh, the best category when the melanoma is thin, meaning uh, one millimeter or less in thickness. Uh, um, when there is an ulceration or when there is a mitosis, we call it uh, uh, T1B, whereas when there is none, it's T1A, et cetera, et cetera. We do the same for the lymph nodes examination. For instance, when the central node uh, when it has been removed is negative, we call it uh, uh, N0. When it has been involved, we call it uh, uh, N1A or N1B, uh, also based on the number of lymph nodes that are involved. Uh, we can give additional information. So uh, uh, this is uh, the type of information you can give uh, uh, and you will inform using the synopsis. Uh, and now we're going to look at a specific report. So of course, all the information, including the pathology report uh, uh, tracking number identifying, so of course they are uh, part of data privacy. Uh, uh, so here you have the clinical information that are very important given by the clinician. And this is an example, a real life example of a pathology report for melanoma. 
you have the confirmation of the diagnosis, uh, where actually it states that this is a melanoma. You have the histological type. This lesion was not ulcerated. Uh, uh, there was no regression. There was an invasion in the endodermis. The uh, melanoma thickness is 0.9 millimeters. Um, and uh, you have other information. If there was a mitosis, it was not completely uh, removed by the surgeon because the lateral margins were, were involved. Uh, and eventually, this lesion uh, was uh, classified as a T1B uh, with a comment that the intraepidermal component is at the contact of, uh, of a lateral margin. Um, before ending uh, uh, this presentation and opening the Q&A uh, part, I just want to mention that the situation has completely drastically changed based on, on two things. The first is immunotherapy, as I mentioned earlier, but the second one is uh, uh, the personalized medicine given to, to cancers, and melanoma is probably a paradigm for personalized medicine. And this is based on the fact that we've been able to capitalize on the basic research done in, uh, in melanoma, uh, and we characterize specific defects in a specific disease. So we don't not only give these histological variables I, I was mentioning, but the, the pathologist's role is also, as a molecular pathologist, to give uh, information on the genetic background of, uh, of these cases. And this is called molecular pathology. So this is the type now of uh, schematic any uh, medical student should know because we are switching to uh, molecular medicine. And this is, for instance, a review uh, uh, that uh, we've been publishing in Lancet with uh, 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 Dr. Lex Ligamont and Dr. Caroline Robert, who is uh, leading the uh, melanoma team at the Gustav Bruce Institute in Paris. So uh, uh, the situation is now very well illustrated by this uh, virtual circle where you have the uh, basic research information uh, generated by basic uh, researchers and uh, uh, now uh, uh, many cl uh, clinicians are also researchers in the academic environments. And this goes to translational research to better identify what type of defects can be identified in the, in the clinical setting. And this leads to a drug development uh, and for instance, uh, this knowledge on BRAF, which is a gene involved uh, in, uh, in, in that is mutated in melanoma, in 50% of melanomas, actually can uh, lead to specific treatments. And actually, this has led to specific, uh, let's call them specific intelligent missiles uh, uh, that will, uh, will be directed specifically toward this abnormal protein. And this is the type of results you can have. This is a patient, this is a PET scan of a patient uh, uh, with multiple metastases. And this is just two weeks after the treatment, actually, where you have a complete disappearance of most of the lesions after this type of approach. And this illustrates the importance of, uh, of molecular medicine and uh, molecular pathology as well. So let's now have a specific case. So this is a male, 30 year one a year, or, or, year old or, of age. Uh, with a recently appeared pigmented lesion in the back. Uh, the lesion was quite large, measuring uh, 0.8 centimeters in diameter. Uh, it, it had irregular borders, heterogeneous pigmentations. You remember that these are uh, uh, criteria of suspicion. And the clinical examination was otherwise normal. So this was precisely the lesion illustrated uh, that uh, had all criteria of uh, A, B, C, D, E that I, that I mentioned. This was the, uh, uh, the histological appearance of the lesion, where you, here you have the epidermis. This is the melanoma with this proliferation of tumor melanocytes. All of these uh, dark uh, uh, spots are actually mel uh, uh, abnormal melanocytes that invade into the dermis. There is an area of regression, meaning spontaneous disappearance of the lesion, but this is not associated with uh, any uh, good prognosis. A higher magnification showing that these melanoma cells invade the epidermis and the dermis. And this is a pathology report for this lesion. Uh, it's a melanoma. Breast thickness is 1.1 millimeters. Ulceration was absent. There were two mitosis, um, etc. You have all the different variables. And at the end, you have uh, the uh, 
TNM, which is this prognostic subgrouping of the patients based on histological information, so the patient was T2A. Uh, sentinel lymph node procedure was done, and uh, actually it was the sentinel lymph node was involved, and the patient was a T2A N1A. And actually, I have to say that this patient uh, uh, was considered as high risk, so had a molecular pathology examination of the primary melanoma, especially for BRAF testing. And this is the type of molecular pathology report we may have. And uh, uh, to look at the BRAF gene, and actually we identified uh, uh, a mutation in this BRAF, uh, uh, BRAF gene. And this mutation allowed the patient that actually became metastatic to receive uh, Vemuraf in it that, was a, that is an anti-BRAF uh, uh, therapy. So this ends this part of the presentation, and of course, uh, I'll be happy of uh, answering any questions. Well, I've, I've already got a few, so I'll get started right away. Is there any evidence in the pathology of NRAS melanoma skin lesions progressing when a patient is on anti-BRAF treatment without the MEK inhibitor? So actually, uh, uh, these patients uh, relate to uh, uh, what I illustrated, which is the fact that in a specific uh, molecular um, pathway, uh, uh, which is what we call uh, in our jargon the, the MACK uh, pathway or MAC kinase uh, um, pathway, you have uh, uh, different types of uh, molecular defects. And I think this is a, a great question to, to illustrate the fact that the situation is more and more complex because you can have uh, different uh, uh, defects, sometimes excluding one each other, sometimes coming together. Uh, uh, and you really have to, to understand very carefully what happens in this specific pathway. So uh, the answer is, uh, is yes, sometimes you can have evolutions that uh, 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 combined anti-BRAF, anti-MEC uh, therapies. Um, but of course, the likelihood of these uh, uh, evolution are reduced by uh, by the treatment. How important is it to have the same pathologist throughout the treatment pathway? It's not. I think this is uh, 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 this is a very important question because uh, this question uh, 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 relates to how robust is a pathology report, um, and the answer actually here is dual. When a lesion is very difficult to diagnose, and some lesions are indeed very difficult to diagnose, uh, usually we, uh, we say that 10% uh, of the lesions uh, are difficult to diagnose and need an expert. And this is especially true for, for melanomas and melanocytic lesions, because this is an area of pathology uh, that is especially difficult. So for these 10% of difficult cases, it's very important that, for instance, a general pathologist uh, uh, refers to a more experienced pathologist in this, uh, in this area and sends the glass slides that are the basis of uh, the, uh, uh, the pathology report to uh, 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 more experienced uh, pathologists uh, and expert pathologists in this field. Having said that, in 90% of the cases, any pathologist is able to inform correctly the pathology report, meaning to reply, to give the appropriate variables with uh, the appropriate level of accuracy. And if this lesion unfortunately recurs, it could be another pathologist who makes uh, uh, the diagnosis on the other lesion. And uh, uh, honestly, the, what we call the inter-observer reproducibility, meaning the robustness of the pathology reports between different pathologists is extremely high. Does the second primary have any similar features to the first primary in a single patient? <laughs> this is a very interesting question. I, uh, so you have some, uh, uh, some melanomas that actually are associated with a specific hereditary gene defects. So all cancers are genetic. It doesn't mean that all cancers are hereditary. Actually, you have 90% approximately of, the, uh, of cancers that are, that are not associated 
with specific family uh, aspects and 10% more or less that are associated with, uh, uh, that are in uh, uh, cancer prone families. For melanoma as well, you have some genes that may, uh, may be uh, uh, associated with hereditary abnormalities or mutations. And when there is a mutation, then uh, this family would have a specific genetic background that would facilitate the occurrence of, of melanomas. And a uh, very classical example are the patients uh, uh, who have uh, dysplastic uh, nevi syndromes or atypical nevi syndromes. Uh, uh, these patients have, uh, can have uh, hundreds of uh, benign moles or nevi uh, that uh, need to be followed up. And uh, when there is a, a melanoma in quite unfortunately a high uh, uh, number of cases, another melanoma can arise. And these two melanomas arising in the context of a dysplastic nervous syndrome uh, share some histological uh, traits. And indeed, they may resemble one the other. Now, if we talk about the, the other 90% of the cases that are not associated with a known heritable uh, uh, genetic uh, defect, then uh, we don't have clear evidence that these melanomas are similar. But the only thing I can say is that, yes, you have patients that have, uh, who have multiple melanomas uh, with no uh, 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 evidenced uh, hereditary genetic trait. And as a pathologist, I can just mention, based on experience, that indeed these melanomas uh, look each other very, uh, very similarly and very closely. So the answer, sorry, it was a bit long, but the answer is yes, in both situations. What exactly does ulceration mean? Ulceration uh, is a very important prognostic variable, and um, this has been uh, especially confirmed by the work done in, the, uh, in Europe in the URTC melanoma group. Uh, ulceration shows that uh, there is an adverse prognostic, uh, it has an adverse prognostic implication. Melanomas with ulceration behave a bit uh, uh, less better than, than melanomas with no ulceration. It means that the epidermis, you remember, this is this part of, uh, of the skin, this most superficial part of the, of the skin, it means that this part of the skin is lost. And this loss is confirmed, it's not clinical, it's confirmed by the pathologist under the microscope. So when this part of the skin is lost, then we call it ulceration, is reported in the pathology report, is part of the TNM grouping we do, called macrostaging, and, uh, and it changes a bit the staging. What is mitosis activity in the tumor, and what is the mitotic index? So mitosis, the, so the, the, any cell will replicate. The, uh, the job of a cell is to give uh, rise to two uh, daughter cells. And the way uh, this cell will give rise to two daughter cells in, in splitting the genetic support, which is called the DNA, is called a replication. And the visible, uh, um, what we call phenotypic, the, the visible um, aspect of that is a mitosis. And um, we count these mitoses in, in the melanoma. Why do we count them? Because actually it's a very easy way to address the proliferation capacity of, of the tumor. And it's very easy to understand automatically. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite logical that a tumor that is able to replicate uh, fast, that is able to uh, expand fast based on replication, is a tumor that uh, might be more aggressive than an indole tumor that will not replicate that fast. So these mitoses are counted because they are uh, uh, phenotypic aspects of the tumor 
associated with uh, uh, its replication capacity. We count them by, by surface, so we normalize that by square millimeter. We count that under the microscope, and we give this information a pathology report. So we give them, for instance, a free mitosis per square millimeter, or no mitosis in the scene of the tumor. What is lymphovascular invasion, and does it mean that it, the cancer is spreading? No, it doesn't mean that the cancer is spreading. This is just an information we analyze looking at the primary tumor, uh, because it has been uh, showed in some studies that being associated with a different uh, prognosis, this is, uh, I think that here we, we touch something that is very important, is that the pathology information contained in the report are not equivalent. Some of them are very important, others are, are, are less important, uh, um, and, um, sorry, I'm going to get back to, uh, uh, to the example I gave. I can't, okay. Yeah, here. So, uh, you have some criteria that are very important, like, uh, of course, the confirmation of the diagnosis, uh, the ulceration that is very important, the thickness that is, in, that is very important, uh, mitosis are important. The others are less important. Why they are less important? Because they are not being showed that strongly associated with prognosis, and this is the case for uh, the vascular invasion or another criteria in the angiotropism. You talked about uh, nevus, but I have a question here about what nevus remnant is. Nevus remnant means that uh, uh, the melanoma rose in a pre-existing nev nevus, and sometimes, not always, like we mentioned that the, some squamous cell carcinoma rise in actinic keratosis, uh, uh, some melanomas rise in, in nevi. Uh, meaning in, in, in benign moles, and sometimes a benign mole will give rise to, uh, to a cancer, uh, melanoma. So this is why it's very important to check uh, your skin at least uh, once a year by uh, a dermatologist uh, or an experienced uh, family doctor, meaning really naked, uh, so our, all the new eye can be checked by, uh, by, the, by, by, by the doctor, and, uh, and when there is uh, a lesion that is a bit suspicious or has changed, then this lesion will be biased or removed, uh, 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 and uh, this, uh, this piece of tissue will be sent to the pathologist for histological examination. So in the uh, melanoma report you just showed us, uh, I, I believe it's towards the bottom of the, or in the, actually the, the slide before, uh, there's uh, peripheral margins and deep margins, and I've got a question here on an explanation on what those mean. Okay, so the margins means the, the sites of, uh, of the sample that has been sent to pathology. And something that uh, is, is important to precise is whether the margins, meaning uh, the, uh, the surgical cats of the sample uh, are involved by the lesion or not. The reason is that when they are not involved, this means that you still have a lesion in place and this lesion may recur. So, uh, for instance, when you remove a squamous cell carcinoma, you want to know uh, whether the lesion has been completely excised or not. So we look at the ages of, uh, of the sample and, uh, um, and we precise whether the lesion has been, uh, is the, the margins are involved or not. Let's say that here, uh, this is not the case here, but let's say that here the, the edges of this slide would have been surgical margins, you would say that uh, the lesion uh, is, is involving the lateral margin. So this means that you have probably uh, the lesion in place in the patient and uh, the uh, clinician or the surgeon has to return to the patient to remove more tissue. Actually, uh, in melanoma, a very, a very long uh, standing debate is uh, how much uh, free margin you want, meaning how large should be the excision, and uh, it varies. Some uh, studies have showed that uh, you need uh, one centimeter, other studies have showed that you need two centimeters in some instances, so this is still an uh, 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 ongoing, uh, ongoing debate. Uh, the second question, and the second part that was uh, 
uh, uh, raised by this question is whether you can do just a partial removal of the lesion for diagnosis or not, and it depends. If you have, for instance, a large uh, a lesion that is suspicious of uh, a squamous cell carcinoma, but you don't know whether it's, uh, it's benign or not, you can do a partial biopsy. But usually we recommend in pigmented lesions like a mel uh, moles or versus uh, melanoma, we recommend, because these lesions are often quite small, to uh, do a complete excision at once so the pathologist can have a complete representation of, uh, of the lesion and can carefully look under the microscope at the whole lesion. We find that some patients have a, an understanding of what their staging is and other patients don't. As a pathologist, do you think that it's important for the patient to know the staging? I think it's important for the patient to understand exactly, uh, uh, to have a quite thorough understanding of uh, his or her uh, uh, lesion, or I think the patient is, of course, and this is obvious to say, but an, uh, an extremely important partner in the uh, therapeutic uh, strategy, and uh, this indeed implies that the patient uh, um, takes uh, inf uh, uh, reliable and precise information on the pathology report, and uh, the staging is a very important uh, element of uh, this pathology report, so yes, I would advise the patient to have at least some understanding of uh, what is at the end of the pathology report in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, microstaging, remember the PTNM category. A patient who's classified as a stage one or stage two, will they, who are not seeing an oncologist, will they also have a pathology report? So, um, uh, First, the, uh, it's important to realize that the PTNM here that we give at the end of the report is different than the staging. The stage, the clinical stage, where the staging, at the end will incorporate some elements of the PTNM, but will incorporate all other information that only the clinician has, like uh, lymph node involvement, presence or absence of metastasis, what type of metastasis, what type of lymph node. Uh, having said that, um, uh, Yes, I mean, a patient that has seen only an oncologist, um, the oncologist will try to confirm the diagnosis. And at some point of, of the disease, the diagnosis has been confirmed by a pathologist. So it's almost impossible to have a patient that uh, has been uh, diagnosed by a medical oncologist, let's say, or dermatologist as a, 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 a stage one or stage two, who, who have not have a, a, a pathology report. At some point, the lesion has been excised or biopsied, uh, and a confirmation of the diagnosis has been made by a pathologist. I have just a question here on clarification of staging. Yes. So, yeah, so what is, what is the one, two, Two, three, four, and okay. A, B. So uh, we are not going to go through the uh, the detailed uh, explanation on uh, on staging, but to stay uh, to give the important information is that staging is a term that designates uh, the, the 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 grouping of the operational arrange, uh, grouping of the patients based on common prognostic information, meaning that patient A will be the same category than patient C, because A and C share the same prognosis based on the pathology report, based on the clinical information. They may have different types of pathology report, different types of clinical information, but they will share approximately the same prognosis. So A and C will be in one group, uh, D and E will be in another group. And again, this staging is only a way to group patients sharing the same prognosis, so approximately the same prognosis, so we, give, we can give them uh, more or less the same therapeutic strategy. And patients who are staged, uh, I guess, in three, are they, are, do they get a, a genetic testing as well? Or a mutation no. testing? Oh, um, so a uh, patient are categorized as stage 3, 
yes, usually have a molecular pathology uh, uh, examination or may have a molecular pathology examination, especially uh, if at some point uh, on what we call a systemic treatment, which is a treatment that would be active on the whole body, uh, will be given. So if at some point a patient uh, may be elected to receive, uh, for instance, an anti BRAF or an anti MEC uh, therapy, uh, yes, a molecular pathology uh, uh, testing will be requested. For instance, to look at specifically at uh, a BRAF gene or other types of or, or RAS genes, but especially BRAF gene, to see whether there is a mutation or not. Because when there is no mutation, for instance, in, uh, in the, a specific molecular pathway, uh, then there is no reason to give a treatment targeting this molecular pathway because the likelihood to respond is almost null. On the contrary, when we identify a, a, an abnormality in this, in this uh, pathway, whether the patient, uh, uh, the patient's clinical situation, and this has to be uh, addressed specifically by the clinician, uh, 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 um, whether this patient's condition requests a systemic treatment, then yes, uh, a molecular pathology test will be done. Well, I, I don't seem to have any more questions at this time, so uh, okay, we can end here. But thank you so much, Dr. Spatz, for your time. Uh, I just would like to remind everyone that the webinar has been recorded and it will be available at saveyourskin.ca next week. Uh, if you do have any other questions, don't hesitate to email myself at sabrina, sabrina at saveyourskin.ca and we'll make sure we'll get those questions answered for you. So thank you again, Dr. Spatz. Thank you so much for your time and thank you to everyone who's participated. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.